Yeah, it's okay. Let her follow up. Let her follow up. So I'm just wondering because there is the health of the woman that's taken into question if she doesn't have the money to have proper health care, or as well as the fact that if she's in college, there's a good chance that she won't be able to continue college. Okay, so now you're adding more more variables to the to the situation. But okay, so let's so let's talk, okay, so so let's take each one of those variables at a time. But I'm going to have to cut off the, the continuing hypothetical after this before she ends up in penury at the end of my minutes. Um, but it's, okay, the, the the idea that she what about the health of the mother? So my view on abortion again, the morality of killing a baby does not change as long as the baby's not actually threatening the life of the mother. In the cases where the baby threatens the life of the mother, like for example, you have a case where a woman has actual breast cancer and she needs chemotherapy, and she's pregnant, but the chemotherapy will abort the baby, which actually does happen, right? That, that is a case where the mother should, I think, be able to get the treatment. That's not the same thing as an abortion. Uh, so they're actually treating the mother for what she's got, and the byproduct of that is the baby is terminally the baby's killed, basically. Uh, that's not the same thing moral. As far as possible, again, all I can say is restate that if this woman, you know, there's about as sympathetic a case as you can make, and I personally would step in to try and help someone like that, and I have a feeling a lot of people in this room would step in to try and help somebody like that, but you're also, I think it's, I do think that it's important to note two things. One, the solution to something horrible happening is not another horrible thing happening in the killing of a baby, which I think is actually horrible, and two, and two, it's really not good to take the marginal case and then use that to argue broad. So what people tend to do is they say, well, what about the girl who's raped? What about her abortion case? So now let me ask you, if the girl weren't raped and she just got pregnant, would you think that she should still have access to an abortion? I do, because I think it's her body and I think it's her health. Right, so you're giving me an out, so you're giving me an exceptional case, so you're giving me an exceptional case in order to prove a rule that you don't actually want to defend. So you're, if, you, if you just come up and ask me, do I think a woman should have an abortion, then we could actually have an argument about, or discussion, about in what cases an abortion was appropriate. But you always, this is what people on the pro-choice side, the, the anti-life side, actually do. What they actually do is they take the marginal case, they take the, the raped you know, woman who has a severe disability, and they say, this is all abortions. That's not all abortions. Significantly less than 1% of all abortions are performed on women who have been raped. So if you want to talk about the epidemic of abortion in the country, over a million abortions performed a year in the United States, let's talk about the other 99% of cases. When you are willing to agree with me that the other 99% of cases are not cases where abortion should be necessary, then I'm willing to have a discussion with you about compromise. But I don't think that's what you want. I think that you're just using the exceptional case in order to try and guilt me into supporting a broad-based abortion platform. <laughs> Okay, so now you're, now you're shifting the scenario. Okay, so now we're just, just to be clear, are we talking about the scenario with the rape or are we talking about the other one? We're talking about every scenario. Okay, because it, no, 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 no. We're not going to do every scenario because all these scenarios are different and I want to discuss them specifically. So if we're going to talk about... 
Okay, so if we're going to talk about the case where the woman is just, she doesn't have access to birth control, which is available at CVS for 32 bucks, you can get a bunch of condoms, okay? It's really not expensive. Uh, if we're, if we're going to talk about, you know, the idea that a woman just was too lazy to use birth control or she got pregnant because the birth control broke, I am, I really do believe, I do really... Well, I mean, since the woman is probably going to bear the burden of pregnancy, both of them might bear the burden. I mean, just actually speaking. Okay, the man has a lot less cost there. The man, she does bear the physical burden. I mean, you're the one calling pregnancy a physical burden, aren't you? Yeah, yeah, but I'm wondering, that the, so you're saying that the man shouldn't have any responsibility? No, I'm saying the man should marry her. You're the one saying the woman should stay single and then rely on the government. Sympathy for the woman and sympathy for have a little sympathy for the child. Okay, at any point does sympathy for the child come in here? You say, you say I don't you say I'm not compromising. I'm the only one in this conversation who's expressed the, the willingness to take money out of my own pocket and put it in somebody else's. So have you donated Planned Parenthood? What is that? Have you donated Planned Parenthood? No, because they kill babies. They kill 300,000 unborn children a year. No, I don't donate to a, a baby genocidal organization. Like percent of what he says. Uh, and I think that the first 100 days is a really stupid measurement just generally, but what it does tend to do is tell you, give you an indicator of what the vision the president has for the country looks like. So Ronald Reagan spent the first 100 days of his, of his administration pushing tax cuts, pushing for smaller government. And even though he didn't pass any legislation, he set the groundwork. And he spent the first 100 days campaigning along those lines. Bill Clinton actually had a really chaotic first 100 days, but he set the groundwork for the idea that that chaos was actually going to lead him to shift to the right, right? Because he wasn't effective. And so he had to move to the right and to the center in order to govern well. Trump. I don't know, he, he never had a worldview. Uh, he doesn't really have a vision for what the country should be. Make America great again is a great slogan, um, but it doesn't really explain what he sees as the future for the country. In fact, I, I wrote a column that will be out in a couple days talking about, you know, our, uh, there's this idea that we're now living in Trump's America. I really don't think that's the case. I think that we're living in the reaction to Obama's America still. I think that Obama sort of set the groundwork, and now Trump is still living within that, within that framework. He's just sort of reversed the polarization a little bit. So Obama was very divisive. He, he had particular groups that he decided he was going to drive to the polls. He wasn't going to care about unifying Americans so much. He came about and said, you know, Americans can be unified by this big government ideology that is embodied in me because I am the great uniter. And then he spent the next eight years basically dividing people for political gain. And I think that Trump is living in that same, in that same framework. He's just reversed it. So I'm going to benefit particular political groups in Wisconsin, Pennsylvania, Ohio, Michigan, and I'm not going to benefit particular groups that, that Obama wanted to benefit, but I generally agree with Obama's basic concept, which is that a bigger government, is po it's possible for us to unify under the auspices of a bigger government through, for example, a $1 trillion stimulus package. We all like bridges. Bridges are great, right? And I think that that's, that, that doesn't bode particularly well for the future of conservatism in his administration, but it all depends on who has his ear. If he's out there campaigning in Pennsylvania and he's doing more speeches in Pennsylvania, whoever cheers the loudest is the person he will resonate to. If Jared and Ivanka are, have his ear and they're cheering him really loudly, then he will resonate to them. My basic working theory of Trumpism right now is that Trump has a knee-jerk reaction to something that he sees on the news, and then whoever cheers him the loudest because becomes his top advisor for the next foreseeable point in time, and then he sees something else that happens in the news. He has a knee-jerk reaction to that. Whoever cheers him the loudest becomes his next political advisor. This explains Bannon. This explains Jared and Ivanka, and, uh, and we'll see how it plays out as time goes on. This is the problem with having a guy who does not have any real philosophy of government. So I'm going to take advantage of having this opportunity to ask you questions and get some free business advice out of you. Um, so I primarily run campaigns here in the Bay Area. In the Bay Area, there are 28 elected legislators on the state and federal level. Of the 28, one is Republican. <laughs> Catherine Baker. <laughs> so how do we win elections 10 miles outside of San Francisco as Republicans? Again, I think that libertarianism is probably the best way to, to campaign in California. I think it is generally, but I think that's the best way to campaign. I also have to say, I, I said this to Neil Kashkari when he was running for governor over and over and over and over. Why aren't you running on crime? Right? You see that Trump ran on crime, and it really helped him. You see, the only time Republicans win in blue areas is when they win on law and order, safety issues, 
Rudy Giuliani wins in New York because of safety issues. Richard Reardon wins in Los Angeles because of safety issues. California has a spike in crime rate because Jerry Brown has decided to redefine crime down and release a bunch of prisoners into the general population and not fund any of the prison system. And quality of life is declining. It's declining in every major city. It's declining in LA. It's declining in San Francisco. You're seeing an uptick of people on the streets because there's been a decline in funding for mental health services in the state of California. It's, it's, he's run this, this state as a disaster, and I don't think that it's out of bounds to say, if you want a cleaner city, if you want a safer city, then you ought to elect people like Republicans because what you're doing clearly is not working so far. I think law and order, here's the bottom line. The, what, what the statistics tend to show is that overall in the United States, men tend to vote Republican, women tend to vote Democrat. That shifts when you talk about safety issues. This is why in 2004, security moms won George Bush the presidency for his second term. And the same thing is true in major cities. People resonate to the safety issue. And it's something like every time a Republican says, I'm going to run as the education candidate, it's like, what are you, stupid? <laughs> you run as the, it's so stupid because it makes for an easy democratic pitch. Okay, you want to spend X amount of dollars? I want to spend X plus 10 amount of dollars <laughs> on, on education. But you actually have the benefit of that same logic with regard to public safety because whatever Democrat says they want to spend on the police, you say, I want to spend X plus 100 on the police. Uh, and you can actually win that particular debate. You know, it's actually interesting you bring that up. So I was reading headlines today. Are you familiar with the BART system out here? Mm -hmm. And there was a, a mob of... Uh, I, I don't know what you want to call them, but they, they, a mob of kids or teenagers boarded a BART train and actually robbed the BART train. And this was really reminiscent of me, like the wow, wow, as you see, you know, like, you know, people ride up. Yeah, they, take your Pelham 123. Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, <laughs> so, you know, how, how do you take that and, and turn it into a campaign and how do you turn votes? I mean, so, for a, so you want to run for a BART director in Oakland as a Republican with things like that going on. How do you, how do, that's what I'm saying, how do you get granular and really get you know, votes on the local level? Well, uh, again, I think that one of the things that Republicans have to assume is that it's going to be a long-term uphill battle. This is not yeah. something where you yeah. shift it overnight. This yeah. is going to be you speaking the truth over and over and over and over without fear or favor. And I think that the, the idea that Republicans have, which is that they're going to go soft pedal this to particular audiences, that you have to soft pedal to the black community law enforcement, I think it's insulting to the black community. Mm -hmm. I think that if you go in there and you say to black folks, well, you know, the reality is that the cops are out to get you and it, it, like Rand Paul has done in certain contexts and we really have to come up with a better way of doing things. Here is the reality of the situation. Every single community in the United States with a high crime rate has had problems with the police. Mm -hmm. Right now, the black community in the United States has a disproportionately high crime rate. That means that the police are going to have more problems in those areas. And that is not due necessarily to racism. Uh, it is due to the fact that when you bring the crime rate down, there's less areas of conflict. There are just less reasons for friction. Uh, and so what you need actually to protect innocent people is you need more law enforcement in these areas. You don't need less law enforcement in these areas. This is why I think the Black Lives Matter movement has done such a tremendous disservice to people who are living in inner cities. When you say take the cops out of the inner cities, the people who suffer are not the, are, are not the uh, or, or who benefit are not the law abiding. The people who suffer are the law abiding. Those are the people who actually need people there enforcing the law. And I think that you know, that, that may be a hard message for, for people to swallow. But again, I think that in a republic, you have to assume that if you speak truth often enough, eventually somebody will hear you. So last local elected question. I think you'll like this one the most. So I know campaigning here in the Bay Area, one of the biggest obstacles we get in convincing moderate and Democrat voters to vote Republican is that they usually come out and say either, yeah, I really like everything you, you think about you know, fiscal issues, but I can't get over the fact you're anti-gay marriage or you hate trans or you know, you, you don't believe in climate change and all those things. So how do you overcome those issues with those voters who, it's, it's not like a one issue voter, but it's a barrier issue. Yeah, well, I, again, so. I think that the libertarianism, I keep saying the word, yeah. but I think that's really the best way to approach this stuff. I mean, the fact is that I think that it is ridiculous. I think it is ridiculous that society has decided, for example, that men can be women and women can be men. I just think there's no scientific basis for that whatsoever. But do whatever the hell you want. I don't care. <laughs> I mean, like, it's your business. You don't do whatever you want. Do whatever you want. Like, this, this idea that I'm discriminating against you because, you know, I am calling you by your biological sex. You know, you don't have a right to tell me what to, what to say. So that's it. So you do what you want. Get whatever treatment you feel like. Wear whatever you want. Be you. I don't care. Um, but, you know, this idea that you get to tell me what to do or say, that's silly because I'm not telling you what to do or say. Uh, as far as same-sex marriage, my perspective on this has been clear for many years. 
Uh, I've always felt, that long before they legalized same-sex marriage in the state of California, I said that, that same-sex marriage should not be a government issue. I thought, that, I thought the government should be completely out of the issue of marriage completely, uh, mainly because the government sucks at things, and also because <laughs> from a conservative point of view, I also think that the government approving particular types of marriage is going to provide a club for particular political groups to beat down on churches. So the next thing is going to be, okay, same-sex marriage has now been approved by the state of California. 501c3 groups, churches, that don't wish to perform same-sex marriage are now going to have their 501c3 status removed because they're discriminating against gay couples. That's the next step. So the solution to this is not to allow that discrimination against religious people and religious institutions to take place. The, the best step after that is to ensure that, that the state just gets out of it completely. And, you know, I feel the same way about marijuana, uh, even though I have never smoked pot and I find people who smoke pot irritating. Uh, I, it's not my business, right? It's not the government's business either. So yeah, I, I think that the, the government getting out of all of these things is, is actually a good pitch because, again, I'm leaving you alone. It, it, I think it's actually a winning campaign now with, with Trump in office because the left hates Trump so much that they keep thinking, oh my God, we created this massive machine and now someone we desperately hate is in charge of it. Like, hey, welcome to the last eight years, gang. <laughs> you know, but it's... But, <laughs> <laughs> but, the, but the best solution to that is, okay, you don't like Trump. I didn't like Obama. Guess what? We can make all of these people not matter to our lives. All we have to do is just make the government not that big. And then I don't care what Trump does, and I don't care what Obama does, and they'll just be egotists who live in big cities and bother you know, whoever will listen to them at the bar. And this, is, this is the biggest problem. You know, the, the, the fact is that, that when the government is big, who is in charge matters. When the government is small, you don't have to care. So I'll let you have your Marco Rubio moment. Um, so... <laughs> Um, there's a lot of uh, college students in the club or in the, in the audience and I think or even younger or people that have graduated but still young and even some uh, college Republicans here uh, you know not everybody could become a, a nationally syndicated well guys the time has come I've officially updated my website as you can see it looks a lot more simple and I've also added some new shirts as you can see they're epic they're also on sale the liberal tears mugs and everything the original is still on there and I actually have something very special to show you guys I have one in real life so here it is this is what it looks like. As you can see, it's printed extremely high quality. And um, what I didn't know is that I actually have it on both sides. So if you're right-handed or left-handed, uh, you'll be able to see a little tears mug from either side. And don't forget, you can also order it without the smiley face if you don't like that. Uh, but it's actually the most popular one, which is pretty funny. So here you go. Here it is. Check out the new website. You can read the description if you want. Check it out. Thank you, guys. Let's get into the video. See you later. To take the marginal case and then use that to argue broad. So what people tend to do is they say, well, what about the girl who's raped? What about her abortion case? So now let me ask you, if the girl weren't raped and she just got pregnant, would you think that she should still have access to an abortion? I do because I think it's her body and I think it's her health. Right, so you're giving me an out, so you're giving me an exceptional case. So you're giving me an exceptional case in order to prove a rule that you don't actually want to defend. So you're, if, you, if you just come up and ask me, do I think a woman should have an abortion, then we could actually have an argument about, or discussion, about in what cases an abortion was appropriate. But you always, this is what people on the pro-choice side, the, the anti-life side, actually do. What they actually do is they take the marginal case, they take the, the raped, you know, woman who has a severe disability, and they say, this is all abortions. That's not all abortions. Significantly less than 1% of all abortions are performed on women who have been raped. So if you want to talk about the epidemic of abortion in the country, over a million abortions performed a year in the United States, let's talk about the other 99% of cases. When you are willing to agree with me that the other 99% of cases are not cases where abortion should be necessary, then I'm willing to have a discussion with you about compromise. But I don't think that's what you want. I think that you're just using the exceptional case in order to try and guilt me into supporting a broad-based abortion platform. <laughs> Okay, so now you're adding more, more variables to the, to the situation. But okay, so let's, 
So let's talk, okay, so, so let's take each one of those variables at a time, but I'm going to have to cut off the, the continuing hypothetical after this before she ends up in penury at the end of my biz. Um, but it's... <laughs> Okay, the, the, the idea that she, what about the health of the mother? So my view on abortion, again, the morality of killing a baby does not change as long as the baby's not actually threatening the life of the mother. In the cases where the baby threatens the life of the mother, like for example, you have a case where a woman has actual breast cancer and she needs chemotherapy and she's pregnant, but the chemotherapy will abort the baby, which actually does happen, right? That, that is a case where the mother should, I think, be able to get the treatment. That's not the same thing as an abortion. Uh, so they're actually treating the mother for what she's got, and the byproduct of that is the baby is determined and the baby's killed, basically. Uh, that's not the same thing morally. As far as Harsh, again, all I can say is restate that if this woman, you know, there's about as sympathetic a case as you can make, and I personally would step in to try and help someone like that, and I have a feeling a lot of people in this room would step in to try and help somebody like that. But you're also... I think it's... I do think that it's important to know two things. One, the solution to something horrible happening is not another horrible thing happening in the killing of a baby, which I think is actually horrible. And two, and two, it's really not good. Reagan spent the first hundred days of his of his administration pushing tax cuts, pushing for smaller government, and even though he didn't pass any legislation, he set the groundwork, and he spent the first 100 days campaigning along those lines. Bill Clinton actually had a really chaotic first 100 days, but he set the groundwork for the idea that that chaos was actually going to lead him to shift to the right, right, because he wasn't effective, and so he had to move to the right and to the center in order to govern well. Trump, I don't know, he, he never had a worldview. Uh, he doesn't really have a vision for what the country should be. Make America Great Again is a great slogan, um, but it doesn't really explain what he sees as the future for the country. In fact, I, I wrote a column that will be out in a couple days talking about, you know, our, uh, there's this idea that we're now living in Trump's America. I really don't think that's the case. I think that we're living in the reaction to Obama's America still. I think that Obama sort of set the groundwork, and now Trump is still living within that, within that framework. He's just sort of reversed the polarization a little bit. So Obama was very divisive. He, he had particular groups that he decided he was going to drive to the polls. He wasn't going to care about unifying Americans so much. He came about and said, you know, Americans can be unified by this big government ideology that is embodied in me because I am the great uniter. And then he spent the next eight years basically dividing people for political gain. And I think that Trump is living in that same in that same framework, he's just reversed it. So I'm going to benefit particular political groups in Wisconsin, Pennsylvania, Ohio, Michigan, and I'm not going to benefit particular groups that, that Obama wanted to benefit, but I generally agree with Obama's basic concept, which is that a bigger government, is po it's possible for us to unify under the auspices of a bigger government through, for example, a $1 trillion stimulus package. We all like bridges. Bridges are great, right? And I think that that's, that, that doesn't bode particularly well for the future of conservatism in his administration, but it all depends on who has his ear. If he's out there campaigning in Pennsylvania, uh, if we're, if we're going to talk about you know, the idea that a woman just was too lazy to use birth control or she got pregnant because the birth control broke, I, am, I really do believe, I do really... Well, I mean, since the woman is probably going to bear the burden of pregnancy, I mean, both of them might bear the burden. I mean, just actually speaking. Okay, the man has a lot less cost there. The man, she does bear the physical burden. I mean, you're the one calling pregnancy a physical burden, aren't you? Yeah, I am, but I'm wondering, that the, so you're saying that the man shouldn't have any responsibility? No, I'm saying the man should marry her. You're the one saying the woman should stay single and then rely on the government. These are two separate issues. Sympathy for the woman and sympathy for, how about a little sympathy for the child? Okay, at any point, does sympathy for the child come in here? You say, you, say, I don't, you say I'm not compromising. I'm the only one in this conversation who's expressed the, the willingness to take money out of my own pocket and put it in somebody else's. So, have you donated Planned Parenthood? What is that? Have you donated Planned Parenthood? No, because they kill babies. They kill 300,000 unborn children a year. No, I don't donate to a, a baby genocidal organization. percent of what he says. Uh, and I think that the first 100 days is a really stupid measurement just generally, but what it does tend to do is tell you, give you an indicator of what the vision the president has for the country looks like. So, Ronald... Any situation, whether she... No, I, I just... Sure.
Okay, because it, no, 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 no. We're not going to do every scenario because all these scenarios are different, and I want to discuss them specifically. So if we're going to talk about, okay, so if we're going to talk about the case where the woman is just she doesn't have access to birth control, which is available at CVS for 32 bucks, you can get a bunch of condoms. Okay, it's really not. Expensive.